right, I think we can go ahead and start. So once again, welcome everybody to week eight. We ready to rumble. Um, so just a quick agenda for today. Um, we'll have a welcome and some announcements, uh, followed by a presentation by today's speaker, Edgar Sotil. Then we'll take a quick break and come back for Q&A. Um, so we do have an announcement. Um, if you're feeling inspired by our speaker series or you're interested in the work that ESLP does, why not join our team? Uh, we're always looking for new members and we do offer remote positions for internships and volunteer work even during remote instruction. Uh, and there's a possibility of receiving a stipend for your work. Um, so if you're interested, uh, email us at eslp at ucsc.edu and we'll get back to you. Uh, also, some quick reminders. Um, UCSC campus elections end today, so make sure you hop on elections.ucsc.edu if you're interested in participating. Uh, also, midterm grades have been posted on a spreadsheet, um, so if you're interested in finding out how you did on your midterm, go ahead and check that. Um, if you're having any problems um, finding your grade, keep in mind that at the bottom of the sheet, there are two different tabs um, for five unit students and two unit students. So make sure you're on the right tab and then you can uh, find your ID number, your student ID um, to see your midterm grade. Also this week, um, action research teams will be doing check-ins for grades. Um, so make sure you check in with your facilitators um, and see how they're communicating that out to you. Um, I know some of the action research teams are doing grade check-ins by email. Um, if you're in the cultivating community action research team, with Amy and I, uh, make sure you hop on our Google Classroom and there's a sign up sheet there. Um, lastly, make sure you keep doing uh, your ref weekly reflections for the um, presentations for the last few weeks um, because those will be turned in along with your uh, final for your action research team. Cool. Um, so now we'll introduce tonight's speaker. Edgar Sochil works on cross pollinating traditional ecological knowledge, queer politics, and indigenous philosophies to connect the dots between de decolonial botany and queer liberation. So Chil is the farm manager at Hummingbird Farm, a collective organizing farm in the Excelsior District in San Francisco. As an urban campesinex and artist, So Chil raises awareness on the importance of flowers as resistance tools to colonialism and climate chaos, while healing the bodies and spirits of queer and trans people of color, rehabilitating the soil, capturing carbon, and providing new genetic memories. As the 2016 Propagation Specialist at the UCSC Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems, Sochil worked on intercropping the decolonization of flowers and queer ecology into the discussion of sustainable agriculture, environmental justice, and climate chaos. So without further ado, welcome Edgar Sochil. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sochil and I'm here. Thank you all for inviting me to be part of your class. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about queer ecology in the age of climate chaos, and then as I go through this, um, yeah, I hope it uh, introduces you all to some new ideas, and then I um, want to go a little bit over not just theory, but also just ways of incorporating queer ecology into uh, environmental uh, justice discussions um, and whatnot. So uh, I wanna start off with an, uh, just a workshop outline, um, do a little open activity um, shortly. Um, we can talk a little bit, uh, just explain who I am and then go over uh, devolution of plants, carbon sequestration, what that is, and, um, and then uh, just power dynamics, uh, hetero heteropatriarchy and then colonization and the impact that has on the way we look at science and nature. And then um, just queer ecology, what it is and how to organize with it. Um, and then this idea of flower bending I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, so the first um, occupied Ohlone territory, AKA San Francisco. Um, I know most of you are on Amamutan land, um, the Santa Cruz area. So I just wanna do a little leaf of sage who that's actually from Santa Cruz, from the farm at UC Santa Cruz. So I'm just gonna light it and then just kind of have everyone just focus on where they're at and just 
you know, just acknowledge this physical space and the people, the First Nations people that whose ecological knowledge we we um, continue to experience. So, just gonna take a quick little moment. Some fire medicine. Um, also, it's the start of Gemini season, so it's another astrological change, and so this changes all around. And so just sending that out there for the transition, the communication, the ability to uh, communicate. Um, so we can all channel in a little bit of that. So just putting some smoke out there for everyone. Um, and just, again, acknowledging, especially as we work with land movements, it's just very important to, to acknowledge First Nations people and whatever movements we go through. So here's this, here's for everyone. So I'm just gonna take a quick moment. I'm gonna have everyone just breathe in with me. All right, thank you everyone for that. Um, so who am I and why am I here talking to y'all, right? So my name is uh, Edgar Sochin. I mainly go by Sochin, but Edgar works fine. Um, these are pronouns, he, him work too. Um, but I'm an urban farmer. I've been uh, just a current uh, generation of my family in farming. Um, and I've been um, farming mainly in, in urban spaces, both in Los Angeles and here in San Francisco. Um, I grew up on the Yakima Reservation in uh, Toppenish, Washington. So that's uh, influenced a lot of my uh, cross-pollination of, of indigeneity and just uh, the way to reflect the land and acknowledging uh, land um, and the spirituality that can come with that. Um, and then when I was in LA, I uh, did a lot of organizing to build gardens. And that's really when I uh, started uh, doing first queer ecology work. Um, and then 2016, I was at UC Santa Cruz um, as a propagation specialist for the Center of Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems. And as a prop specialist, um, that plant sale for that year, um, the theme that I organized on was decolonizing flowers. And I'll explain what that is further going on. And then, uh, like I mentioned, I live in San Francisco now. I do edible landscaping for a landscaping company, as well as uh, I'm the farm manager at a collective uh, farm in San Francisco called the Hummingbird Farm. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more of that as I go forward. Next slide, please. So this slide here is just a, a quick image of the evolution of plants. I find it very important because as, as we're looking, as we're having the discussion of fossil fuels and sustainability and whatnot, I find it important to acknowledge that fossil fuels are plant ancestors. Um, and I think we forget that a lot. Um, and we just look at them as a, a pocket of energy. Um, but here we can see um, you know, about 500 million years ago, first land plants start showing up on, on Earth. Um, and the main thing I wanna focus on here is uh, at the very end is you have 190 million years ago is when the first flowering plants show up. That's about 310 million years in between the first plants, mosses, uh, and then flowers. So the main thing I want to emphasize here is that flowers are the youngest plants in existence on Earth right now. Um, and so they're like the children. So we look at fossil fuels as the ancestors, flowers would be the, the, our children, our youth, right? As we look at solutions to climate chaos, the youth, investing in youth is what's gonna allow generational change and that it, I would see that very similarly as we look at our plants. Um, so 190 million years ago flowers show up, 10 million years ago grasses evolve on earth so that so that includes our major staple crops, corn, rice, and wheat. Um, and then three million years after that um, humans just show up on earth. So we have we've been here fairly young. Uh, next slide. And then here, it uh, just explains that fossil fuels are captured pockets of sunshine. But if you look at all the plants that are displayed in this image, there are snow flowers. And again, that's it. the point I'm trying to emphasize is that it's all early mosses, ferns, and then the very first uh, gymnosperms, pine bearing, uh, seed bearing plants. Um, but yeah, so no, no flowers. Um, so when we're all our fossil fuel consumption, there's no flowers in that yet. Next slide, please. So climate chaos. So 
Um, I prefer to use climate chaos over climate change. And the main reason is that climate change makes it sound like there, it's a dial of some sort and we can change it back versus climate chaos is just the redistribution of that carbon into the atmosphere. And it's gonna impact everything. There's no avoiding the changes that are about to come. Um, just like those first plants were evolving to capture and, and change the, the, the interactions of carbon on earth is what those first plants did. Um, so all the future uh, generations are gonna be impacted by the actions or inactions of today. Um, and it's not a change, it's just a, a, a chaotic pattern that, again, flowers can help us navigate through some of that. Um, sexual reproduction in plants gives new genetic material, um, and that's essentially part of the solution is these adaptations to droughts, fires, floods, hurricanes are gonna come one generation at a time. Um, and again, it requires pollinization, and that's uh, a, an interaction that can take two or more. Um, and is that idea of, of non-monogamous pairing of reproduction is another example of the queerness that already exists in nature. Um, and then uh, the organizing people and plants to co-evolve and sequester carbon. Um, again, we have to work together um, because it's not just humans who want to survive climate chaos, it's also our plant friends because all the plants that um, have built with that humans and, and plants have built a relationship to co-evolve. Um, they're also dependent on us to get them through um, as we are dependent on them to feed us, clothe us, heal us, shelter us. Um, those are all things that, that we need through this. Uh, next page. All right, so decolonization um, is, uh, so before we get into uh, decolonizing our flowers, um, I'm sure some, most of you have some experience with this, but in case you don't, uh, what is colonization? It's the process of systematic control, um, dominating the land and its resources, constituents, and that's usually done through violence, war, disease, imperialism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it erases knowledge of various kinds uh, language, ecological, food, cultural. Um, and so in this context, uh, colonization um, has created the framework on ecological and evolutionary thought and has been used for the justification of oppression. Some examples of that is uh, scientific racism. Um, you know, again, science constructed to reinforce white supremacy. Um, heterosexual reproductive behavior as a positive or what is natural. Um, and it, a lot of this uh, colonial framework has, has created and reinforced the binary over our, as we understand science. And I think it's super important for us to acknowledge that this colonization has interweaven itself into what we validate as knowledge. And so the, as we're looking for solutions to climate chaos, that is the stuff that we need to move in a direction of sustainability and leaving the stuff that's actually got us to, in this problem to begin with. So that's part of the decolonization that I'm addressing here. Next. Um, so heteropatriarchy, I just think it's important, uh, again, to just kind of state it in case, because um, it could be thrown around. I just want to make sure that we all are on the same page of what exactly that is. And so heteropatriarchy is a power structure, um, power and social structure that is created to uh, allow people at the top to obtain the most power and privilege. Um, and so in this case, we start with humans being greater than nature and having this idea of being able to just go into nature and extract the resources that we need without um, the hierarchy already of just extraction versus coexistence. And that's a very uh, Western way of looking at nature um, that is derived from this heteropatriarchy system. And so within that, you have a man uh, who's, who has more power than woman. Um, and so that creates its own set of power dynamics. Can we go to the next, there we go. And then if we break this even more, um, you can have heterosexual individuals have more power and privilege than homosexuals. And then even if within that, you have cisgendered people have more power and privilege than transgender people. And so again, this creates a pyramid of some sort or a power structure that, um, has been integrated into uh, the science of the validation of that academic uh, understanding. And what we are 
reinforced repeatedly to value. Um, and again, as we're looking at environmental sustainability, this is the thing, these are the concepts that we need to dismantle as we look, as we construct the solutions for tomorrow and our future generations. So next slide, please. So decolonizing your flower, um, and, and this is again, the theme that I, I used as our plant sale. Um, and essentially my work around this and just uh, the idea behind it is deconstruct the legacy of colonialism and heteropatriarchy involved in the founders of Western science, specifically in flowers, because flowers is how botany is structured. Um, and it took multiple people in Europe trying to create an order out of this, out of what plants were. And um, this was a consequence of colonization where people were leaving Europe to obtain plant material and bringing it back and having to create a new structure. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit more of that further on. Um, but it, uh, the, another big thing about this is recovering the social and spiritual knowledge and practices of plants. Um, the thing with val academic knowledge of plants, AKA botany, um, it's used as a way to differentiate and devalue other forms of plant knowledge, herbalism, um, you know, medicine making a different form, building material. Um, those are all seen as sub levels of academic understanding of plants. So plants is, is a hierarchy to have, the, to be validated as a botanist is to be able to uh, reinforce some of these, these colonial ways of organizing and valuing plants as a way to ex extract knowledge or materials or information or resources rather than coexisting with these plants. And that would be the social and spiritual knowledge that co came with these flowers or these plants and how we harvest them. And the idea of plant medicine is not just um, this, this pharmaceutical idea where you can just take something and heal yourself. It's a relationship that you build with these plants to, to heal yourself through that relationship. Um, next slide, please. Um, here's a more example, again, colonial botany. Um, it's the result of the expansion of Europe, of colonial Europe, um, you know, first with Africa, then Asia, and then the Americas. And through these colonial um, expeditions, you, uh, people start bringing plant material. And again, it's the elite people of Europe, uh, both Tanfiliacs, who began the sponsorship of these expeditions, as well as the investment in greenhouse technology. And I think that's super important to understand because greenhouses exist to allow plants to live in ecosystems where they don't belong. And again, that's colonialism, right? You're, you're taking people, and again, the first greenhouses were the rich, the elite, who had, who were showing off rare plants, and people still do this, right? People still share rare plants and whatnot. Um, in this image here, uh, this, this invention here is called the Wardian case. And again, this is the first, uh, transportation devices to move plants from one ecosystem to the other, specifically in ocean voyages. So you want to avoid excess salt, ex you know, regulate the temperature of your plants as you're moving them through the, the voyages of sea. Because um, you're, you're only getting paid if you can bring something back. Um, and again, that's that extractive uh, process of uh, plants. Um, and so again, this influx of plant material create uh, forces uh, people in Europe to start figuring out, start to create a way to organize all this this plant material. Uh, next, so essentially what I'm trying to say at all is, is ecology is a social construct. Um, we look at it, we think we tend to think of ecology as a natural concept, um, and there is a lot of nature in ecology. But the way we under ecology as a, as an academic study is a social construct that reinforces this. Uh, the power structure of the people who created. And again, that's cis, white men, rich men, um, who, again, they're the only ones being able to educate themselves. Then within, uh, once they're in the system, Linnaeus specifically is the first, uh, he's what we would call the founder of academic botany. Um, and, he, and he published the first botanical book. Um, organizing plants by flowers 
Um, there's previously uh, other botanists or other scientists botanists who were trying to figure out a way to organize flower or plants. Um, but Linne Linnaeus is the first person to do it by flowers. Um, and because he created a way to organize plants, then he started organizing animals as well, including humans. So um, Linnaeus is responsible for the creation of race, of how we understand race. Um, so again, that's uh, Caucasian, Negro, and uh, Oriental, and I forgot the last one, but he is responsible for that language to be used today. Um, and then starting with ecology, botany, this expanded to all other natural forms of science. So uh, zoology, entomology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and within this uh, labeling, uh, the people in, in power, and again, this is the colonization, are able to replace people, places, and original names with European names. And so uh, there's a lot of examples, and there's a few later on the slide that I'll just jump in and explain. But um, a lot of this, oh, here we go. Yeah, that, that's good. So the Coco Xochitl, for example, um, is the national flower of Mexico. Um, and it's also the official flower of San Francisco. And again, its common name is Dahlia, and that's named after a Swedish botanist. Um, but the, the name means water stem flower or hollow stem flower. And then Sempa Xochitl is another one um, who uh, is a flower used for the dead. Um, and I use these two because Coco Xochitl, although it is a national flower, it's, the spiritual tie wasn't as strong as the Sempa Xochitl. So we've kind of locked it's recorded in books, but not on the cultural norm. It's very few people call it by the Coco Xochitl. Most people, even in Mexico, they call it the Dahlia. Um, whereas the Sempa Xochitl is a different story. Because again, the spiritual ties. Um, and then uh, there's, uh, in 1570, Francisco Hernandez uh, was sent to Mexico by the Spanish crown. And his job was to teach English to the natives. But in doing so, he was put with the botanical group of natives. and so. Uh, he's recorded a lot of these original names because um, the Spanish burned a lot of these texts, the original texts. And so what it what is left in, in some of these names that isn't still living in, among the people is documented in, in his work that's in Europe. Next, next. Um, so yeah, so ecology is a social construct and so is queer. Queer, um, is uh, it's an umbrella term, uh, it's a reclaimed derogatory term, um, and it, it's, it's more problematic with older generations, but newer generations tend to embrace it more. Um, and again, it's an LGBTQ plus uh, inclusive term. It's an umbrella term, um, some people are okay with it or not, but um, it has the capacity to expand its focus uh, beyond any kind of just sexual activity. Um, that, uh, and I, I enjoy the most out of this word is that it, it can turn, it can go from a noun to a verb. And in that verb, it's, it's when doing, when changing the language in that sense, um, you can start addressing and helping deconstruct some of the, the way that heteronormativity has, has been implemented in anything, right? Um, so queer ecology is a tool to, to reclaim our ecologies under the heteronormative lens. And everyone really benefits from queer ecology as it challenges heteropatriarchy. Um, and essentially, queer ecology is the intersection of, of ecology and queer liberation. And I'll explain a little bit more as we go forward. I just wanted to talk a little bit about this back, this flower here. Uh, it's called Laiatris is a scientific name, but its common name is gay feather. Um, and so it's a, it's a good cut flower, but in, um, ex this kind of, um, normal naming and incorporating into our farm production allows other people to just kind of normalize queerness in nature. And this, this is just one example of how you can use it. And I'll, I'll get more, but that's just the naming. Um, again, it's part of our flower production, but uh, it's just, uh, just playing with the names. Next slide, please. Uh, so queer ecology is a tool to deconstruct. Um, so the dominant understanding is that male and female reproductive parts on the same body is considered bad, unnatural, et cetera. 
there's a lot of examples in nature that show that you can have both of your reductive parts on the same body. Um, so that that is a way um, queer ecology can be used. Uh, again, another dominant understanding in humans is organisms are either male or female and don't change. And so when people fall out of that, there's, it's problematic in queer ecology, shows as examples in nature how that is a survival tactic. Um, uh, changing or having both or whatnot. Um, another dominant understanding in humans is heterosexual behavior is good and natural, whereas homosexual behavior is bad and unnatural. And again, these are all the things that Linnaeus and all these early uh, Europeans were creating this understanding of nature, were embedding into the science, and then it just kept perpetuating as time went by. Um, Dominant understanding, again, is sexual interaction only occurs between two agents at any time. Um, and again, this is the monogamous view that gets continuously put on us uh, through society, but nature, again, show in, just in pollination, it's a sexual activity involving at least three agents, but there could be hundreds. Um, and so again, uh, there's just an example of, of how we can use queer ecology to deconstruct some of these uh, main um, understandings that we're continuously perpetuated, especially as, as we are learning scientific and ecological knowledge, and um, as we prepare to use that knowledge to uh, build a sustainable future. So queer ecology can help us deconstruct, uh, deconstruct the, that paradigm and build something better for all of us. Um, again, queer ecology changes uh, the uh, this idea of what is natural. Um, and like I mentioned, it, it's, all this is just reinforcing the people who are in power. Um, and the solutions to climate chaos involve a new paradigm of science that moves us forward towards sustainable practices. Um, and I already said the other thing, so some images of queer animals, mammals. Uh, next slide. Here, uh, gender is, is again used to uh, label flowers, and um, you know there's no such thing as a female or male flower. Those are all social concepts. Um, at the farm that we use, again, because we still need to learn teach pollination and what that means um, to our youth. Um, so at the at the farm that that I'm working at, and um, we tend to use pollen producer and fruit producing flowers. Um, and again, that takes the gender away. Um, and, uh, and it gives uh, power to the plant itself for what it's producing and, and the relationship that we have with it and the other organisms. So, um, and then another thing that I just want to mention here is that when flowers have the two reproductive parts on, um, in different flower structures, they're considered imperfect flowers, but when they're in the same flower, they're considered perfect flowers. But that understanding, again, it, it's, it's these heteronormative ideas that are laced in there. And unless we, we deconstruct it, we'll never really process it. And we'll just reinforce this knowledge as we teach next generations of, of what we need to know, right? We, we need to know what successful pollination looks like so that we can feed ourselves. Because, you know, that's zucchinis, apples, you know, any eggplants, et cetera. Um, but we don't need to reinforce this heteronormative idea of how we look at flowers and, and the way the fruit is produced. Um, so, you know, two reproductive organs on the flower, perfect, two reproductive organs on a human, unnatural, freak of nature, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if we're looking, if ecology is, is supposed to be a reflection of nature, um, we should reflect that in how we value and see each other as well. So gender doesn't exist, it's a human construct. Next slide, please. Here's examples of just some queer animals. I just want to share some behavior on some of these. Um, the first academic paper that was uh, that showed and validated queerness in animals was the seagulls. Was uh, seagulls. So prior to this, any kind of behavior that was seen as homosexual or queer or whatnot, any kind of um, scientist, uh, ecologist. Um, that was documenting this was ridiculed. So, you know, uh, peer reviewing and whatnot uh, forced these people to alter their information in ways that um, 
didn't make them sound like they were perverting the animals and whatnot. So um, the giraffes, for example, uh, male giraffes have a lot of sex together. You know, they're isolated. Um, they don't live in a herd most of the time, um, unless they're the alpha of that herd or whatnot. But the males tend to be uh, on the side and they have a lot of sex with each other. That's just what they do. They're practicing, they're having fun or whatever. You know, they're just being giraffes, right? Um, but the people who were documenting that were seen as perverted because there's no, how could credence exist in nature? And so a lot of these early be, uh, documentation of what credence could be in nature was seen as aggressive behavior. And again, they're, they're turning this, you know, they're enjoying themselves. They're not attacking each other. Um, but what was acceptable at the time um, was to just call it unnatural and it was aggressive. They were not, they weren't behaving naturally, but it was the, the seagulls, um, there was a, a husband and wife. So again, they had this uh, relationship of heteronormativity that allowed them to publish their paper. Um, but in, in their paper, they noticed that seagulls, that there was, uh, if, if any of you know, seagulls tend to uh, have their nests on islands and they're super territorial. Uh, but they have their little space, they build a nest, and, uh, you know, they, they take turns taking care of the eggs. But they were, uh, th in this paper, um, they, were they were noticing these super cluster of eggs. So normally you have like two to three eggs per pair of seagulls. And so they were noticing five to eight eggs uh, in these nests, and they were trying to figure out, these pair were trying to figure out. So they caught the, the parents nesting, and they realized that there was a lot of lesbian couples forming. So they were going off, getting their eggs fertilized by some male, and then coming back to their nest with their female lesbian seagull and raising their kids together. Um, that was the first paper that was that validated homosexuality in animals. Um, since then, there's been a lot more, um, and lesbian seagulls, you know, we have them to thank for the rest of this. Um, but. Uh, Canadian geese are on the opposite end. They're two male geese will pair and they'll go raid some hetero geese nests and take over their eggs, right? And they'll raise them as their own. Um, you know, that wouldn't go so well in, in a human context, but again, you have two male geese raising children for their own. Same thing with penguins. Penguins have been recorded in zoos, um, raising eggs um, in same-sex couples. Um, and in nature, they, two male penguins will trade rocks for eggs. And again, if you're a hetero couple of penguins, it makes sense to, if you have two chicks, give up one and get some rocks to keep your one chick warmer, right? And then you, you increase the survival rate of your offspring by giving one up to a couple that's willing to, to raise it as their own. And then lions, lions are always queer. Here we just have two showing affection, right? And so I just want to show that. Um, yeah, so those are just some examples. There's plenty of other examples of queerness. These are just a few that I just wanted to share. Um, yeah. Um, here's an example of clownfish changing sex. And this happens, uh, you know, in, 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 these, in this species of fish. Um, and so the alpha in a, in a clownfish cluster is a female um, or egg laying individual. And so here you can see the evolutionary advantage of being the egg laying individual and having everyone below you producing sperm. It's much harder to produce eggs than it is sperm. And so it makes more sense to be the one with the limiting resource and laying the eggs. Um, and so the female will be around, or this egg laying individual will be around. Go to another cluster and then come back, and then this will change um, the fish's reproductive organ. And this can go back and forth repeatedly. There's some species of fish that will pair up monogamously for life, but both fishes will change their gender. And, and the reason they do that is because in their male form is the only time they, or in their sperm laying form, is the only time they actually grow. So a, a, fish, a pair of fish will meet up, one will turn female, 
slash egg laying, the older male sperm producing. And then the, the male will keep growing, get to a certain point, and then the, both of them will switch sexes so that the, the fish that was female can start, once they transform into male, transition similar to what's going on here, then they can actually physically start growing again and they'll grow bigger than their partner and then they'll flip all over again. And so they'll continue to, re, uh, to switch sexes so that the, while they're in their male form, they can expand, physically expand their body um, and grow. Um, again, it's, it's wild, it's crazy, but it exists. Um, again, these are paradigms that don't exist in humans. And like I mentioned at the very beginning, we've only been on the planet for 7 million years. A lot of these organisms have been here for a lot longer and they've developed these tactics to survive for the long run. Um, yeah, so a lot of gender fluidity in fish, sex fluidity. So, um, and this is natural. This, again, it happens in the ocean. We don't know. Uh, amphibians are also very good at this, of flipping um, sexual organs. Um, and then they also have the consequences of chemicals and um, hormone alterating uh, compounds that can exist in the water and that will secrete through their system and could throw some of this off. Um, yeah, next slide. Flower bending. All right, so this is a concept I've been working on and can we go to the next, this is the picture. So flower bending um, is uh, something I was, that came to me through kind of uh, relearning Nahual and just understanding, uh, putting this word Sochi Olin, which Sochi means flower and Olin means movement. And so flower bending takes a little bit of influence from Xochipilli, the uh, Aztec Prince of Flowers, but also Avatar, um, kind of the last airbender. And, and this idea of like not necessarily breaking something, but bending it. And more specifically, moving flowers through time. Moving flowers, bending flowers through time. Because I mentioned earlier, flowers are the youngest plants on Earth. Um, and they can adapt via, again, pollinization uh, quicker than the plants that capture the carbon in the first place. Um, and so this idea of moving flowers to time is what we need as we move through the solutions of climate chaos, flowers are going to be a crucial part of how we navigate through that for our food, for our building materials, for our medicines, for our spirituality. Um, and there's another one in there. Uh, building materials, food, medicine, uh, spirituality. There's five reasons why we care. It'll come back to me. Um, and it gets, it's a reaffirmation of our, of our own selves, that we are special flowers. Um, in, in Mexica philosophy, Sochi um, is the last day of the month. And essentially what it signifies is that our, us as humans, we are a precious flower that when, when we were born, we essentially is our cut date of our, you know, when we harvest a flower and each of us have, has our own individual base life, essentially, our own bloom life. Um, and so that um, is our ecological relationship with nature. You know, we are that precious flower. Um, and again, that could look like anything. And, and the second image I have below here is a, a thistle flower. So again, you can be super soft or you can be really hard, but each of us is that special flower. And, and we can, we can, we can adapt however our flower needs to, right? We could be sweet and smelly, potent, or we could be sharp and protective. But again, it's the resources, it's what's caused us to get there, our strengths, they got our ability to get there. Um, and, and we have a physical, cultural, and spiritual role in adapting to climate chaos. Um, you know, and, and we, it's, it can't just be hard science, it has to be the social relationships um, because solutions are not just science, they're people. It's, if we want to be part of that solution, if, we want to, if humans want to survive, it can't just be science, it needs to be social relationships. And this idea um, of organizing and using flower bending, it's, it's not just for now, it's like future. It's this is, when we're thinking of seven generations forward, if we can think of our current positions 
if we're lucky, there's four generations around us, give or take. But for most of us, that might be two or three. So seven generations would be, I don't know, about 100 years. And so what is, what is queer liberation? What is flower bending? What does ecological work look like 100 years from now? You know, that's, that's what we're building now. And, and this is the kind of the ideas of how do we integrate queer liberation with ecological justice. And I'll give examples of how we're doing that now. Um, and then the same forces that destroy our social identity um, are also the same forces that ravage the earth. Heteropatriarchy, capitalism, globalization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so again, it's flower bending is an expression of nature um, in our interconnectedness and interdependency to queer ecology. Um, and again, queer ecology is just deconstructing the ecology we do know. Um, uh, all right, I think that's good. Next page. So Urban Capicinex, this is the farm that I, uh, this is the group of, of farmers uh, that I work with. Um, our, the farm that, that I manage in San Francisco is called Hummingbird Farm. Um, it's, we're into our third season as a farm, but the project was bigger. It's, it's been about six years. I was in Santa Cruz when the initial organizing happened. Um, and it was a group of youth, of San Francisco youth, who came up with the term uh, Urban Compassing X. And so this is an introduction of um, how do we use language to incorporate queer identity or gender nonconforming identity as earth workers, as sustainable ag workers, as earth healers. Um, and this is, again, it was youth who created this um, in, I think this was 2000. 14 to 16 is the first, the organizing with the community, politicians, trying to get the land itself. It's in the Excelsior um, neighborhood in San Francisco, which is the south of the city. It's got the largest uh, per capita of children in the city. Um, it's got a lot of uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, Latinx community um, in the space. Um, some of the lowest um, food access to food, uh, highest rates of asthma in the city. Um, it is also, uh, it's in an open park. So it's at McLaren Park. Uh, it's the third largest park in the city and it's six acres. So it, it's, it's a big project um, and we're working through it. Um, and it, we're incorporating queer ecology into the creation and organizing of the farm. Because um, we're trying to not only preserve cultural foodways and ecological knowledge, but creating a safe space for queer youth to connect, learn, heal from the soil, and normalize queerness as they're working, not just with queer youth, but everyone. Um, and so even just the name, the Campesin X, especially with older Latinx immigrant families, it's a very good con uh, starting conversation point. Um, um, and then we just keep going, we share knowledge, and can we go to the next slide? Um, this, this is our, our main uh, organizing themes. We want to make the farm intergenerational, intercultural, educational, uh, collective decision making, incorporate ceremony, and, mo and more of all, most of all, just putting public lands in people's hands and what does that look like. Um, it's not a community garden and we're really, uh, we really try to emphasize that because community gardens can reinforce colonial ideas of land. Um, because when you look at, when you think of a community garden, the language says community, but who has access to a community? If you look at parts in the city, they're locked up. They're like, unless you have a, a plot of land, a, a plot in this garden, you don't have access. You, um, you, if you have access to the land, you can get into the garden and you are part of this garden community. Um, but if you don't have access, if you don't have a plot, very few gardens incorporate ways to uh, include community members that don't have access to land. Um, I've seen a few other examples, a few gardens in my travels that have rose to the occasion to this. And there's um, one way that I've seen this done is you have membership dues for people who have land and then you can, you extend in, uh, membership to other people in the community who don't have access to a plot, but it, it can at least enter the garden and enjoy the green space the communal spaces of the area, you know, they're a little bit more involved. So um, our farm has no fences, there's no gates, um, which is both good and bad. Um, it allows everyone to come in, um, but sometimes 
things disappear. Um, but the idea, again, behind it is, is not so much to feed San Francisco with the farm, but to organize San Francisco, to organize our communities, to incorporate ways to um, build a more resilient food system through our farm. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, the next couple of slides are an example of events. But before I go into this, I want to just talk a little bit about our opening to the farm. Um, the first, the first time we were going to open, we had to postpone our studies because of the Santa Rosa fires. And so the air quality is bad. This was in 2007, 17, um, 2018. I mean, no, it's 2018 was our first year. I'm all over. 2019, we had a propose, we postponed, no, 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 that's right. 2017, first year, 2018, we po postponed our one year anniversary because of the cap fire. So um, a lot of the, the original celebrations were postponed by climate chaotic events. And so the following spring, we planted a lot of herbs um, for respiratory health. We have uh, people in, our, in, in the farm collective group organizing that uh, have been using our plants to make tinctures and, and other medicines for community members. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to share that part. But um, here we have our amaranth, uh, we had our amaranth harvest and uh, we harvested our amaranth and we had a small ceremony. Um, and with that intention, we just had a lot of queer presence. Um, and I know you can't tell people are queer by a picture, or maybe you can, but these two pictures are among the queerest pictures that I could find from that day. But um, a lot of the conversation, we were talking about uh, the, the similarities between amaranth and queerness and the way to survive, again, through the resi resilience and, resist, um, and survivalness of ourselves and our queer identities and our two-spirit queer identities and our plant medicines, relatives. Um, and one thing, and for folks who don't know, amaranth was, it's a spiritual plant, high in protein, um, you know, it's used in a lot of cereals today. But during the first part of the first hundred years on the Americas, the Spanish tried to ban this plant from being grown. It was, it was prohibited, but it's really resilient. And so a lot of the discussion that came out of this with the people was, it's super red it stands out, there's no, it's a strength. Um, and it's resilient. And so it just kind of, a lot of the people in this, in, during this day were talking about just how they can relate to their queer identity as part of, of not being able to hide who you are and just embracing it, being part, being part of the solution to the, the ecosystem around you. Uh, next. Um. This is Rooted Recipes, and this is an API organization that used the farm to um, for one of their events. And a lot of their uh, educational or, uh, organizing is connecting API community to traditional foodways that have been lost through migration and whatnot. So this is a, a way to incorporate uh, history, food, um, and just that that living memory, that collective memory. So uh, we hosted them, and then uh, they they helped us with the farm, like some work on the farm, but it was mainly a way to create some of that intercultural, intergenerational dialogue with our other people in our community. Next. Um, here's a, uh, our meat becks. Um, so this is a, uh, something that our team has been working on and it's moving beyond this idea of three sisters, because again, that reinforces this heteronormative idea of women, of sisters. So some of the stuff that we've been using on the language you've been using on the farm is meat becks or thinking beyond like edma neck so siblings rather than sisters and incorporating more than three because you companion planting should not be just three individuals or three plants it could be a, a variety of plants and this allows us to step away from uh this idea of traditional families and, and start looking at what queerness and queer relationships, queer family, chosen families can look like. Um, so, to, but using, you, having that discussion through this conversation of companion planting, how plants can work together to benefit from their variety, uh, different um, elements of the, 
of the land that they're occupying that they're using that's coexisting. So um, in the picture to the left with the corn, at the bottom, there's some chia seeds, there's some corn, there's the amaranth in front, there was some flowers. There's more corn behind me in that picture, but. Um, and then this was uh, during uh, Chicano moratorium. Um, and again, just being able to, sh the Chicano moratorium is a, uh, an anti-Chicano uh, movement that was, uh, anti-war movement and so we had people come over from all over the bay and you know a lot of these are older chicano um old school civil rights leaders right and whatnot um but they they also need a little push right we got to keep moving forward um because that's an older generation that that could be one generation you know i'm a millennial that's my generation and then there's youth and kids and whatnot that's easily we have five six generations there um but we it on the farm, we're trying to incorporate normalizing this um, this language and these concepts so that people can start thinking um, beyond our us and start looking at, at future generations and how they'll incorporate some of this knowledge. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here's a, another uh, example, um, just uh, other queer folks using the space for, again, to just feel normal. But if you look, actually go back one more. Um, this, the corn here um, is another great example. This just happened naturally. And again, it could be because of our intentions, which I, I would uh, put there. But you would have the kernels forming on the tassel. And, and that, again, doesn't happen. I mean, it can happen. And again, that is just the chromosomes, the, the, type, the, the tassel, the pollen producing flower became a pollen receiving flower. And in that, you have kernels growing at the tassel. And usually you, those grow in the, the husk. And so this was a great uh, example that we were able to share uh, how those seeds are still valid, valuable, they're still valid. They're just not growing in the way that we normally see them as or think of them as, but that is a survival tactic. And for whatever reason, this corn decided to alter its, where it's producing its fruit. And again, that's just just in another example about queerness to show that it's just queerness using as the language to, to break the, what we think is normal, and that quote unquote is not normal. It's natural for sure. So I just wanted to show that. Next slide, please. Uh, so where are we um, now in the age of COVID? Um, April was really hard for us. Um, we kind of had shut down for a little bit. It was just very bare minimum between me and my other um, co-manager. Um, and just recently in May with some of the, we spent a lot of time in April just trying to figure out how to keep the bare minimums going. And uh, it was just very overwhelming. This is a lot of work for two people. And it, because we're using the space to organize for climate chaos, for feeding our people and whatnot, um, it's been really hard. We just started uh, opening up the farm to uh, on a, the, well, their official work days, but they require a little bit more coordination now because what we're doing is we're having, since a lot of people have been sheltering in place and they're ready to come out, um, we've had a lot of interest in people wanting to volunteer, but we have to kind of uh coordinated a lot better to to have people come in as in families and work in family pods so again it's, it's uh isolating people so that they can work um with the soil connect to that to the the all the things we were talking about but also reduce the uh or in, uh, incorporate social distancing into that so in these two images uh to the left is just uh some of our workers and they'll show up again in another slide but to the right, we have a family that came in and they were in this box on this raised bed. And actually, they've been coming pretty consistently. Um, but there's six of them. And again, they work, they live in a family, so we can keep them together. Um, we have someone now just uh, in front of our shed, just regulating tool, tools, sanitizing tools as they get used. We have a uh, hand washing station. Uh, we, we had soap and whatnot before, but now it, it, we have a, a much more um 
strategic way or, or procedural way to, to have people come in. It's still a work in progress. Um, you know, our, our main priority is keep, pe keeping people safe and we've had to uh, turn people away just because we, we got to a point where there was just a lot of people showing up and then we want people to enjoy the space, but it, if we can't guarantee people being able to work in a socially distant way, we just ask them to come look at it and then keep moving. And, and so we're doing sign-up sheet. It's a little, um, but it's, it's just a reflection of our time, honestly. Can we go to the next slide? And then, if, yeah. Uh, so the three individuals in the back, that's one family uh, unit, and then Londres are in the front here. Um, is our is my other co-manager so next page next slide um all right so some of the takeaways um uh botany as is you know i think the big thing that i really want is botany as scientific knowledge is created by people benefiting from colonialism um it's what we when we think of validation of scientific knowledge is what we think of uh is botany or uh, but these concepts have been uh, tainted or uh, heteropatriarchy has been incorporated into it. And we unknowingly reinforce those ideas because a lot of us haven't taken the time or um, to delve into these ideas. How do we, how do we deconstruct some of this? Um, and how am I re, uh, re, um, reinforcing some of these, these terms uh, this this heteronormative language when I'm trying to teach scientific knowledge because that's we do want to share knowledge we want to share survival information the plant information with the next generation but we can be the agent of change as we transfer that knowledge um, you know this scientific the academic science has been a key force in the validation of how we treat people that can fall outside of that unnatural category. And we have plenty of examples of that sort of violence in legislation and religious institutions. Um, but in legislation and whatnot, science, as we look at science as a solution, um, it's important to understand that uh, sometimes that science can be harmful. And queer ecology is a tool to reclaim our bodies and the ecologies we complete. Um, each of us has our own individual ecologies, our body, our intestinal, our insides. Um, you know, and nature is inherently queer. Um, and queer, I'm using, again, it's, it's language, it's the social construction of language. Um, but by using queer ecology, it allows us to really just dig deeper and see what are the things that have been, that I'm absorbed without the understanding that there's a, a power structure behind it. Um, and climate justice work involves the interconnected reality we live in. Um, queer and trans bodies are the front line of climate chaos, whether it's a hurricane or a fire and queer folks end up at a shelter and then they're forced again into a binary structure at the shelter um, or, you know, they've been kicked out um, and whatnot. So there's a lot of people are suffering um, and queer and trans bodies um, already suffer a lot from state violence, um, but also from ecological violence. Uh, and flower bending, again, this is natural affirmation to organize in our communities um, and just incorporating the idea that we are natural. We are as precious as flowers. We belong to the earth because when we, when we internalize that we are unnatural is when we, act, that's when, our, when we hold ourselves back or we, it, it takes a lot of mental energy to continuously combat the fact that we are uh, unnatural and that's what society tells us all the time. Um, so flower bendings, you know, looking at flowers as your regalia to reinforce that, that we are natural, we are, you know, sacred. And then uh, biology of our planet is, is what drives us, not the chemistry. There's plenty of compounds, definitely carbon and, and oxygen and all these or, or elements in other planets, but it's the biology of ours. It's these, the process of photosynthesis, the plants, the photosynthetic organisms that can do that that have really changed our, um, our planet. And just like we um, are a product of our human ancestors, we're also a product of our plant ancestors. Um, so, and then 
think that might be it. There's my contact info um, if you're all interested. Um, and then we were gonna break, I hope that was all able to, to absorb that was useful. And I just, um, we we're gonna break up into small groups next. And I just had one uh, question for you all to, to there we go, break out. Um, so we're gonna break up into groups soon. Um, and then if you all can just, you know, take some time to just share this and reflect a little bit. Um, how does queer ecology already show up in your life and how can queer ecology be incorporated into your tool chest to better engage in social and environmental justice? And then we'll take a break. And then if you have any questions for me, I'll be here after that. Hey, Edgar, can I ask you a question? Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, I was wondering, you, you mentioned like earlier that you're trying to look at, um, I mean, you said, or what'd you say? You said like flowers, um, they don't like have sex or, or they don't, they don't ascribe to like a gender really. We just like ascribe gender onto them. Um, how do you, how do you, how did you say we talk about flowers and reproduction um, outside of that framework? Oh, that gender framework? Uh, well, at the farm that I work at in other spaces, um, we use flower uh, pollen producing and fruit producing. Okay. Um, and then the gender is also imposed into like irrigation parks. I didn't really talk about this, but uh, so if you go to an irrigation store, you would get a female and a male adapters. Actually, they do this for uh, electronics too. But again, that in that sense, they're uh, emphasizing penetration. So the male part is the part that penetrates the female part. And then other ways that the, I've heard people refer to that is thread in, thread out, or similar to belly button in and out, um, rather than using female male. Okay. Um, I guess building off of that too, like I'm, I'm really interested by like queer theory and um, all the stuff you're talking about is really interesting. Um, but something I guess I haven't learned a lot about is how do you distinguish like, I took a class and they talked about um, your social sex versus your biological sex. Mm -hmm. And how do you, how do you like separate someone's biological sex from like a heteronormative like narrative or like that sort of hetero patriarchy? Mm, the I wouldn't say you you should have to separate it, but that would be where other people would tell you. Um, and the best way to not even put yourself in that boat is just use general neutral terms. If you don't know, stay neutral and let yeah. people let you know. Um, and people. In my experience, as long as you know you're being respectful, though, they have no problem sharing that because it shows an effort that you're trying to reflect their identity. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, they're social. The 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 biological aspect of it, um, I would just say stick to neutral, if you can. Okay. Um, it'll just save you um, it's just it gets complicated to me because it's like in this queer movement and like I also identify as queer it's like you're we're trying to you know deconstruct and move past like these past narratives and heteronormative narratives and everything but it's at the same time like you're trying to describe what the normal is by using like normal terminology you know yeah, and you know the language. You know, the, it's it's generational work. You know, we're it's not it's not just gonna we we're just a part of the bigger picture, um, mm -hmm. and as we normalize this for us, and we are with the younger people in our lives, it'll be easier for them to pick up um, okay. because it what we're we're essentially what we're doing, you know. I would say anyone that's not a child anymore, we're trying to unlearn everything we've been taught around these things, um, gender, sexuality, what is natural and unnatural, um, versus if you can teach a child that they are natural and just some of this information, 
they'll construct their reality with that as part of it versus them trying to deconstruct what we've been taught. And that's where a lot of us are at, mm-hmm. especially in environmental uh, and ecological sciences, because, you know, we're, especially we're entering these sciences as part of the solution of climate chaos. We're entering this because we want to do something about the change, about the chaos. Um, that and we just incorporate, we absorb the scientific knowledge as for what it is without taking the, the part, the useful information and then allowing us to build it and share it that isn't perpetuating some of these oppressive uh, undertones. Okay, that makes sense. So you're like trying to look at that science through like a queer framework in order to like, sh- like show, I guess, what like the future could look like. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because cause it, it, within this too, it's like, if you have, you know, let's just take, for example, since you said you're queer, having you be able to be comfortable in who you are and absorb this other knowledge is going to make you better at integrating not just yourself but the information versus if you're spending the time hiding who you are you're spending that mental energy blocking these, some of these connections that can happen naturally um and so for people for some people who haven't had who haven't been able to do that internal work to just at least get to the basics of who they are or their right sexual identity for whatever reason, um, that just kind of inhibits some of the connections that could be made with your identity on, you know, and this goes for any identity uh, uh, label that you can choose. But if you have to spend energy to, you know, you're color, you're queer, you're disabled, you know, whatever it is, if you're spending time uh, blocking those elements of who you are, it's not going to let you rise to your potential. So queer ecology is also, I find it as a way to empower those individuals to be, uh, and just to be themselves. Because by being yourselves, you can, again, build connections in your head to see solutions different. And that's really what we need. We need, it's the same science that got us to this point where we're at, as we're trying to dig ourselves out of this hole, we're relying on that same science. We just, we still need some of that science. We just need to look at it in a different way and incorporate it in different ways. That's awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and bring it back, everyone. Um, so now we're going to open the space um, to any questions for Sojil. So if you'd like, um, you can put your question um, in the chat. And uh, just so we can have them go in the order they were asked, um, so if you'd like to ask it yourself, um, to like unmute and vocalize your question, please put an asterisk um, in your question, like at the end, or otherwise, if you'd um, like for Sochil to read it out of the chat or for an ESLP organizer to ask the question, um, you can leave it with that, without an asterisk. Um, and this, this time is also for any bringbacks you'd like to share um, from your discussion group. So let's go. Um, there's a question regarding uh, what I think about agriculture of animals in the U.S. Um, uh, I haven't really been involved with a lot of meat production, um, or I had rabbits and guinea pigs once upon a time, mainly for composting to help compost. Um, but uh, I definitely think that industrial agriculture of, of meat production is part of the problem. Um, but I, I don't have a lot of work myself with producing animals. Um, you know, especially with COVID and just the meat packing plants and whatnot. It's just, uh, it's a commodification of our animals and, he, and our humans. Um, so yeah, so I'm not a big fan of mass production of food, or not food, but uh, meat. Um, if that was incorporated into agriculture in one way or another, I think we could work on that. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that's it. Uh, next question. Can you explain how plants aren't actually gendered? I believe you said something that, okay. So yeah, uh, plants, um, the idea of the flowers being gendered is a human concept. The, uh, 
the human construct there. But uh, the way we, the language we use at our farm um, is fruit producing and, and pollen producing or uh, pollen producing, uh, pollen receiving. But uh, I prefer to use the producing on both ends because it just empowers both flowers. One produces flower and one produces fruit. Um, um, and then I, uh, and I didn't say this so much, but um, in irrigation parts are also sold in by gender. Um, and again, that has to do with uh, whatever part of the irrigation is going to go into the other. So it's this idea of penetration um, and that's what the male part of the irrigation would be. And then uh, the part intaking would be the female. Um, so the way I, uh, I've heard language um, uh, address that is uh, thread in, thread out. Um, Similar to belly button in and out rather than using the gendered aspect of the parts. Um, so, yeah. Uh, do I know any other animals that change lifestyle through their lifetimes other than clownfish? Uh, I mentioned uh, other species of fish. Amphibians are some of the land mammals. Uh, deer, I didn't so much talk about deer. They don't really change their sex, but why tell deer uh, there's a high population of deer sex individuals? So, um, and then there's uh, other organisms that uh, display both reproductive organs that tend to uh, use only one at certain parts of their life. So, um, snails, mollusks. Octopi are, are good examples of those. Um, yeah, let me see. Uh, what my group talked about was how it was crazy how the papers and articles about animals about queering or natural were disregarded even with proper research methods. Do you think science today or has it gotten better? Mm. Uh, definitely with animals, it's definitely much more uh, accepted. Uh, but I think the manipulation of data can be used in any way, not just in, in gender, but um, especially with, as we're looking at climate science, um, that could be uh, misconstructed based on what the results are that people want to use. Uh, let me see. Frogs, frogs can also change sex. Frogs are um, fro frogs and to be highly sensitive to uh, hormones. Um, and again, it has to do with their they have skin, but it's not uh, skin like us or even reptiles that can block certain hormones from entering because they're just all membrane on amphibians. They tend to absorb those hormones pretty quickly. And so highly sensitive to birth control. Uh, social media, uh, let's see. Social media so we can follow. It's at Eco Channel Garden Cholo. You can on there. Uh, Banana slugs do have both reproductive organs. Um, so they're hermaphroditic. Um, and again, depending on what their mood is for, the, for their reproductive time, they can either decide to produce sperm or receive sperm. Uh, can you talk about the importance of teaching kids how queer theory plays into the constructive narrowing ways of thinking? Um, I, I would say that this queer theory or whatnot is us as adults, young or young adults, older adults and whatnot, really deconstructing what we've been taught all our lives and help and finding ways to uh, validate and empower ourselves. And so I, I, teaching youth, not as you don't have to call it queer theory. And I know we, I use queer ecology and, and when I'm using this in, in with the youth, I really import, reinforce that they are natural. And then, and then then bring your theory into it in that because it's important for youth to construct their identity by incorporating all these elements of uh, all these uh, elements of queer ecology um, without necessarily having to call it queer ecology because the more important part is that for them to understand that they are natural and they're an important part of the solution both in their consumption and in their assistance in helping plants sequester carbon. Um, so I think that um, that part is much more important um, 
than calling it queer theory, but it, uh, enforcing that they are the solution and that um, it's it's easier for us to construct stronger kids and, ha and then having the youth later on help uh, deconstruct what, you know, all this sense of being unnatural. Um, and then a garden space is a great way to just build parallels uh, of how things can be outside of their norms, but still be part of nature. And, so, and that corn, that corn on the top was a great example of that. Um, and there was one other part that I wanted to share. Uh, oh yeah, and th uh, this queer theory, queer ecology and whatnot is, uh, you know, it's, we are just a part of the builder, the bigger picture um, of what this can look like. And um, the, the solutions a hundred years from now will incorporate some of this. Um, and we need, you know, if youth are queer or gender non-conforming or however they want to fall into that spectrum, this is important for them to remember that they are natural because if they can hold that part of their identity of being natural, it allows them to use their brain to connect other, um, to connect to other elements of knowledge that can help build a solution. Um, could you possibly type the social handle? Okay. Um, actually, I'd like to ask a question. Um, so do you have any advice or like particular lessons um, you learned in organizing the Urban Compass Unix program or like a community agriculture program like that? Mm, well, with, at, at this farm specifically, um, I started off as a volunteer um, after I left San Francisco. Um, I would say just in general, if you enter any spaces, uh, follow leaders, other folks' leadership, whoever's holding that space. Um, I think that's really important um, because, you know, doing that, I was able to offer what I had and then um, fill in the, a gap that they had because um, they needed someone who had the experience of managing a farm and growing space. Um, and that's how I got in it. Like, as this role, but um, part of my involvement in, the, in as their farm manager, um, and I mentioned that on there a few times, um, is that I wanted someone who grew up and who helped build the, the farm itself from the start to, in the long term, um, be the farm manager. Um, and so right now I'm working on, essentially, alone there are my co-managers, my apprentice of one way or another. And so my goal is to have her ultimately be the farm manager and be able to facilitate production of, of crops. Um, but my, my advice would be to you know, follow the, their cues, offer advice, but you know, regard, you know, even though I, I may have more knowledge of uh, in this agricultural context, I let them lead me. Um, so they found it appropriate to have me hold that, hold the leadership space that I do now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions? Thank you, Sochu, for an awesome, uh, really eye-opening and motivating presentation. Thank you, everyone, for, holding, for letting me be here and sharing my little story. But thank you. And Good luck on your studies and, you know, thank you for holding the space that you all do.